what comes to mind when you think of a Neanderthal. Even though perceptions of these ancient humans have changed drastically over the past few decades, it is still likely that the word is synonymous with brutish, primitive, knuckle-dragging apes. The classic image of Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthal, is that of a dim-witted savage wielding a colossal club which it uses to bash its tribe mates on the head. 20th century pop culture is full of these depictions, and general publics all over the world have come to know the Neanderthal as a monster, a subhuman, more ape than man. The reality could not be more different. Homo neanderthalensis was in fact as human as you and I. They lived complicated lives. They created music and art. They were exceedingly intelligent. And they even interbred with us, the first Homo sapiens. That's right. It's more than likely that your DNA contains that of the Neanderthals that were roaming much of the Northern Hemisphere in the late Pleistocene Epoch. These early men and women were just that, men and women. Although they belonged to a different species to our ancestors, they were just as human as you and I, only in their own way. Obviously, there are no living, breathing Neanderthals around today. But, we do know they coexisted with our ancestors. So what happened to them? Where did they all go? Today, we will be answering these questions and more as we take an in-depth look at Homo neanderthalensis, some of our closest cousins in the hominid world. We will look at many aspects of Neanderthal life as we do so. Their culture, their lifestyles, their evolution, and their appearances. Join us as we take an intriguing trip into the lives, loves, and legacies of Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals. Homo neanderthalensis appeared on the scene between 315,000 years ago and 430,000 years ago. Studies are still incomplete as to exactly when the first Neanderthals began to evolve, but it seems to be that they began to appear gradually within this time frame, which is a tiny step on the grand geological scale of life. Imagine the geological timescale of planet Earth on a timeline spanning one year. The dawn of time is January 1st, and right now is December 31st. The Neanderthals appeared and disappeared within roughly a minute or two on this scale. We are much, much closer to them than you might think. The average Neanderthal would have been noticeably different to the Homo sapiens they shared the planet with. At first glance, these men and women would have been difficult to tell apart from those of our own species. But a close-up encounter would certainly aid to identify them. The average Neanderthal was shorter and stockier than the average Homo sapiens. They were built much bulkier to help them withstand the brutal elements of their Ice Age homes with wider arms and legs. Their torsos were barrel-shaped with thick, curved ribs and wide pelvises to further aid success in this harsh lifestyle. The face of a Neanderthal was also easy to tell apart from that of a modern human. Their brows protruded further than ours. Their chins were straight and short. Their foreheads sloped slightly, and their noses were large, broad, and flat to help filter the cold air. The Neanderthals were much more well adapted to the colder, freezing climates of the Northern Hemisphere. And that is just where they lived. 
Neanderthals were native to Eurasia until about 40,000 years ago when they began to mysteriously disappear from the fossil records of the time. Large populations of Neanderthals were focused in Western Europe, specifically across the Iberian Peninsula, France, and Germany. Germany, in particular, is a wonderful site for Neanderthal fossils, and many populations have been unearthed in the region. Small populations of Neanderthals even managed to make it to the British Isles, where they thrived alongside our earliest ancestors for a while. As one travels east towards Asia, Neanderthal populations begin to become more few and far between as you approach Central Asia. But the species thrived in the cold north, up towards Siberia, the Baltic Sea, and Scandinavia. Populations of Neanderthal are indeed known from warmer climates in Central Asia and the Middle East. But Neanderthals did better, further away from these warmer climates, favoring the wide-open steppes, tundra, and plains, and the now-extinct megafauna that lived alongside them. The prime habitat of the Neanderthal was the Mammoth Steppe, planet Earth's most extensive continuous biome. Characterized by an abundance of grasses, sparse woodlands, and huge Pleistocene mammals, the Mammoth Steppe is the environment we most closely associate with the Ice Age. It spanned for much of Homo neanderthalensis's range, right through from the western Iberian Peninsula, right the way through to the eastern coast of Russia, even spilling over into Canada. As the Earth began to warm towards the end of the Pleistocene, the Mammoth Steppe disappeared, and so did many of its inhabitants. The Neanderthal life cycle was similar to that of modern-day human beings. It is theorized that, while ancestral species such as Homo habilis and Homo erectus typically matured very fast, later species such as Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens opted to delay their maturity to later on in life to allow their brain to develop further. As such, it is likely that Neanderthals and modern humans reached maturity at a similar stage in life. Their gestation periods were probably very similar, and females typically would have reached menopause at a similar time to modern women. It is these coinciding features that may have encouraged Neanderthals to begin interbreeding with Homo sapiens. The Neanderthals were, all in all, perfectly adapted to their environments. Their barrel-shaped bodies and tough, thick limbs allowed for a great deal of physical strength and resistance against the elements, be that from freezing weather or attacks from tough megafaunal mammals. Their large bodies and short statures would have helped them to retain body heat better than Homo sapiens would have been able to, allowing them to populate the regions further north than our ancestors did, helping them to avoid competition for food. Their noses, broad and flat, would have been able to filter the cold air well, and the species would have found it much easier to breathe in the frigid northern realms of Eurasia. When written out in black and white, it looks as though the Neanderthals were much better suited to a life on the freezing tundra than we Homo sapiens were. But the existence of the Neanderthal into the modern day was not to be. Just less than 500,000 years ago, Neanderthals began to appear on the fossil record across Eurasia. Homo heidelbergensis, a descendant of Homo erectus, which thrived in the Middle Pleistocene epoch across Europe, 
and possibly Asia and Africa, was the species that would give rise to Homo neanderthalensis around this time. A lot of confusion and debate still continues to persist around just when Neanderthals officially first appeared on the scene. But it seems to be that it was this species and roughly this time that the scales started to tip towards Homo heidelbergensis becoming an intelligent new species, separating from itself into two different directions. One branch of Homo heidelbergensis would split off and become Homo neanderthalensis, whereas another would go a separate way, evolving to become Homo sapiens, us. Again, experts are not 100% certain as to what exactly happened to cause this taxonomical split. The leading theory is that geographical isolation played a part as it did with the separation of Homo habilis into Homo erectus millennia prior to this. Scientists propose that a population of Homo heidelbergensis around the time that Neanderthals began to appear were isolated by a geographical barrier. In this case, a massive glaciation event. Successfully adapting to this new environment instead of succumbing to the harsh climate the population began to change. They became bulky and more visually human-like. They began to breed, form communities, and adopt this new glacial lifestyle as one they would favor and became known as a new species, the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals, once they adapted to their new home, were then able to spread themselves out conquering new territories across the wild northern realms of Eurasia. As they evolved and thrived, they became more intelligent, harnessing the power of new and powerful technologies, such as fire, weaponry, and clothing. They would bump into an array of new creatures that they were able to both interact with and hunt new species of human, such as us, and the now extinct Denisovans, Homo Denisova. The new species of megafauna, some of which were also newly evolved from the glaciation event, were prime targets for this powerful new hunting technology, and the Neanderthals thrived on these steps for many thousands of years. We have lots of compelling evidence that Homo neanderthalensis populations coexisted and interacted with other species of human. After the Neanderthals evolved and started to spread out across the northern continents, they would have begun to encounter strange creatures that looked almost like themselves. Taller, lighter humans with more angular faces and complex communicative abilities would have been found further south. These were the earliest members of our own species, Homo sapiens. As the Neanderthals began to conquer the east, they would have caught rare glimpses of a creature which perhaps looked more similar to themselves. The Denisovans, or Homo Denisova, a mysterious and controversial taxon that may or may not have been its own species, populated the northern reaches of Siberia and much of East Asia. It's amazing to think about how these early encounters must have played out. What would have gone through the mind of the first Homo sapiens as they discovered that other sapient species were emerging on the steppes? Did they even recognize them as different? What about the Denisovans? We can't even say for sure what this species looked like, so what must the Neanderthals have thought as family groups intertwined for the first time? What we do know is that many of these interactions were likely non-confrontational. Quite the opposite, in fact. 
Substantial evidence exists that Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens interbred, and often did so. That evidence is overwhelming in the modern day, now that scientists have sequenced the genome of multiple human races and species. All non-Sub-Saharan genomes within the Homo sapiens species, for example, contain Neanderthal DNA. This is most prominent in modern Europeans and Asians, which coincide with the Neanderthal's historic home territories. The average modern European human is made up of anywhere between 1.8% and 2.4% of Neanderthal DNA, and the average modern Asian human is made up of anywhere between 2.3 and 2.6% of Neanderthal DNA. The fact that these two species interbred is not just a theory. It is hard proven scientific fact. Interspecific families and perhaps even groups may have existed across the steps of the late Pleistocene. Fascinating scenarios where hybrid children were accompanied by parents from both Sapiens and Neanderthalensis descent. Again, it is unknown just how common these occurrences were. But for modern humans to contain noticeable traces of Neanderthal DNA in their genomes, it must have been more common than you'd expect. Evidence also persists, albeit more sparsely, that Neanderthals interbred with the Denisovans they encountered on the Asian continent, up in Siberia and towards the center. One thing that can be discerned when comparing Homo sapiens to Homo neanderthalensis is that human technology was ultimately more advanced than Neanderthal technology. This is just one theory which has been put forward to justify the Neanderthal's demise. Perhaps they simply could not compete. As human numbers increased, Neanderthal populations may have dwindled as Homo sapiens used their tools and knowledge to conquer wider swaths of land. Territories may have begun to cross over one another, and it wouldn't have been long before the two species were competing for survival. This theory concludes that the humans with their superior technologies, eventually outlasted their Neanderthal cousins. The first thing that can be said about the lifestyle of a Neanderthal is that it wasn't an easy life. These men and women led short, violent lives, which is part of the reason why their bodies needed to be so stocky and robust Studies show that between 79 and 94% of all known Neanderthal specimens hold evidence of healed major traumas. A good example of this is that of a specimen known as Shanidar 1, taken from a cave in northern Iraq. This individual shows evidence of a right arm amputation, an infection of the bone where the arm was amputated, issues with vision, and possible hearing loss. Perhaps the Neanderthal in question sustained these injuries from an animal attack or interspecific combat. It is therefore estimated when analyzing the ages of the individuals known to science that over 80% of Neanderthals perished before they reached 40 years of age. It was a dangerous and brief life out on the mammoth steppe. The majority of known Neanderthal injuries are thought to have been sustained from attacks from wild animals. As the climate grew colder, the animals of the steppe grew bigger and more dangerous, and many of them sought shelter from the elements in caves. The Neanderthals wanted these caves for themselves and often found themselves fighting for competition over cave space with the deadly carnivorous mammals that had taken up residence therein, meaning that such attacks were frequent and life-threatening. 
hunting would have also caused severe injuries, as would have intergroup conflicts. Some Neanderthals are known to have sustained major blade wounds to the head and torso, indicating that while they might have had friendly relations with our ancestors, tensions between rival groups may have been high on a conspecific level. Taking a look at just what the Neanderthals were hunting can also give us some insight as to why some of these injuries were so common. They were one of the first human species to hunt challenging big game. They are known to have primarily taken medium-sized ungulates, such as red deer, ibex, and reindeer. But the steppe was rife with opportunity, and larger creatures were often systematically hunted. These include woolly rhinoceroses, aurochs, straight-tusked elephants, and the iconic woolly mammoths. As you can probably imagine, these wouldn't have been the easiest hunts, when all you had to defend yourself was a spear. Not all Neanderthals appear to have tackled such challenging prey though. And as we move around the world, we see different cuisines start to take hold. While populations in the north hunted megafauna, coastal groups in Gibraltar appear to have eaten smaller prey, such as game birds, quails, and corn crakes, as well as several species of lark were consumed in these societies. But due to their proximity to the coast, seafood was a speciality. Everything from shellfish to tuna, right through to dolphins and seals, were killed, butchered, and consumed by the Neanderthals living in these coastal Iberian groups. But certain populations took their diets a step further still. Some vegetarian communities are known from inland Spain, where the Neanderthals living there rarely needed to hunt. The nutrients they needed came from wild mushrooms, various species of mosses, and pine nuts that grew in the area. Most Neanderthal communities were notoriously skilled cooks and could adapt and prepare various types of food in various different ways. Food was roasted, boiled, and eaten raw. And some communities are known to have prepared complex meals and broths out of the local ingredients. Many societies were traditional hunter-gatherers relying upon many sources of food to satiate their hunger. The megafauna hunters of the north were not strict carnivores and would have supplemented their diet with vegetables. These hunter-gatherer societies ranged in size from around 10 individuals to up to 30 in larger settlements, and both men and women are known to have shared labor both sexes took part in all manner of jobs, from hunting to cooking, to crafting and scouting. The Neanderthals are also known for their complex tools and primitive technologies. They are associated with the Mousterian stone tool industry, which saw many new objects, structures, creations, and weapons arise. Neanderthals are known to have used javelins, spears, and knives as weapons and tools to hunt and craft, but it doesn't stop there. Some communities may have used darts to subdue their prey. Specialized scrapers were used to butcher animals, and needles were used to craft early clothes. These clothes probably weren't too complex, and were likely ill-fitting, but they did the job of keeping individuals warm in patches of cold weather. These simple clothes were made from animal hide and fur, and would have been similar to blankets or ponchos used and worn by modern humans. Some groups of Neanderthals 
are known to have harnessed the power of birch bark tar, a sticky substance found in birch trees that helped these early men and women to construct their weapons and tools. Some communities in the Ionian Sea are even known to have developed basic seafaring tools, rafts and paddles that could transport individuals across bodies of water for a short time. Neanderthals even pushed the boat out in terms of their medicinal capabilities. Some sites show extensive use of splint settings on bones to cure injuries, and a wide range of medicinal plants were acknowledged, collected, and consumed to kill pain or help with disinfection. The Neanderthals are also known to be keen and skilled users of fire, they were adept in starting fires to their advantage in order to cook food, aid in hunts, or to keep communities warm in the harsh climates of the Pleistocene Ice Age. Fire was either transported or started in order to aid the family groups, and it may have been a key component of the weaponry that allowed them to bring down creatures as large and powerful as the woolly mammoths of the vast mammoth steppes. From these fires, Neanderthals built stone hearths in caves that would burn throughout the winter to keep societies warm. The presence of such hearths also indicate that they had some knowledge of air circulation. Building the hearths in specific locations with ventilation so members of the group would not choke on the fumes injected into the caves from the hearth fire's smoke. There would have been some trial and error in all of this technology, and certain abilities would have taken the Neanderthals longer to master than others. Some Neanderthals in what is now France are thought to have had access to and knowledge surrounding basic string and cordage which could have allowed for the production of a wide range of tools and objects, which would have made life much easier for these early men and women. With string, they could have harnessed nets to catch fish and other animals, beds within their cave homes, shoes to protect and warm their extremities, and simple walls and flooring to create huts or tents Carrying devices, such as woven baskets, could have been constructed with string, as could have tie ropes to secure traps. The examples go on, but if Neanderthals did use string in these ways, there may be a lost world of primitive technology that is waiting to be discovered. Neanderthals also had a specific culture that separated them from that of Homo sapiens. It is vague and unknown if Neanderthals followed a certain set of beliefs or religion, but they did bury their dead, which could denote to a belief in some sort of afterlife or basic rituals around passing on. Neanderthal graves are known across their territories. Some individuals may have even worn simple, primitive jewelry made out of stones, bones, and feathers to denote status or decorate themselves. This may have played a part in forming an early culture or perhaps even religion if such jewelry was worn on specific occasions. Some groups of Neanderthals are known to have produced art and music Cave scratchings from sites in Gibraltar are known, where Neanderthals have created patterns or imagery by carving their scrapers or knives into the rocks of caves. Bone flutes have been uncovered from certain Neanderthal archaeological sites, made from the victims of successful hunts. These flutes may have been used to communicate on hunts mimic the sounds of animals, scare certain creatures away, or simply because Neanderthals enjoyed the sounds they made. 
at an extreme level. Some Neanderthal communities are thought to have formed what appear to be early cults or religions, surrounding particular aspects of wildlife. At some funeral sites, animal remains have been arranged in a decorative fashion, which may note that the Neanderthals at these sites had some form of connection between the creatures involved and the individual that is passed on. The Golden Eagle, an iconic and famous species of bird of prey, has been included in such rituals. The majestic nature and the power that the creature exudes, combined with the consistency of the use of this species in this manner, may indicate that this was a religious choice. To this day, it is not known if Neanderthals were able to communicate in a fully-fledged language, but we do know that they were very vocally adept. Individuals are known to have made a wide range of whoops, shouts, bellows, screams, mutters, and chatters, indicating that, while they may not have been able to speak in the same way you or I can, they were definitely more vocally advanced than the hominids and other apes that preceded them. A basic vocal language of proto-words and phrases may have been used to communicate, but Neanderthals would have been extremely expressive beings and used a wide range of sounds and expressions to denote emotion. The Mammoth Steppe was a harsh environment, and as the Neanderthals evolved, so did the rest of the wildlife in the region. This time and place in paleontology is synonymous with megafauna, massive mammals and other creatures that evolved to cope with the changing climates. America, for example, is known for its mastodons, big cats, terror birds, and ground sloths. Australia had its giant marsupials, and Africa is still known for its megafauna today. Elephants, giraffes, rhinos, and hippos all qualify. The mammoth steppe of Eurasia, however, had the most iconic megafauna of all. Walking alongside our Neanderthal cousins, as well as early Homo sapiens, would have been, as the Mammoth Steppe's name suggests, mammoths. Gigantic elephant species with woolly coats and long, curved tusks migrated across the Eurasian steppes in huge numbers, usually led by a female matriarch. Well adapted for dealing with the cold, and consuming the tough grasses of the steppe, the mammoths thrived for hundreds of thousands of years, and the last remaining population persisted on Wrangel Island in northeastern Russia until around 10,000 years ago. These gigantic proboscideans would have been a challenging but rewarding hunt for early groups of Neanderthals out on the steppe Alongside the mammoths lived many other species of megafaunal mammal. The woolly rhinoceros was prominent, a species of large, bulky rhinoceros with a woolly coat and large horn. In Siberia, Elasmotherium would have persisted against the cold climates. This rhino-esque creature was once thought to have one single colossal horn, leading to the moniker the Siberian Unicorn. But recent studies show it had a flatter, stouter horn, much like a modern Indian rhinoceros. The mighty straight-tusked elephant would have lived in scattered groups on the Great Mammoth Steppe, another challenging hunt for our Neanderthals. The aurochs, a species of large, extinct cattle that only went extinct in 1627, would have thrived in huge numbers too. 
perhaps the most spectacular animal of the mammoth steppe, was Megaloceros, the largest species of deer ever to live. Measuring roughly three meters tall, with an antler span of nearly four meters, this gigantic cervid would have roamed the steppe in small groups, perhaps coming together in the rutting season. This is a species that also would have been targeted as food by early humans. The mammoth steppe was not without its dangers, however, and humans were still very much on the menu for some of the region's carnivorous residents. The Eurasian cave lion was perhaps the biggest threat to Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens, which would have violently fought back against the Neanderthals encroaching on its cave space. Cave hyenas populated the steppe also, a larger, more heavily built relative of the African spotted hyena. Cave bears too, although primarily herbivorous, would have aggressively fought off invading humans were they to get too close to the warm caves in which they lived. Various modern species of predator lived on the steppe also. Wolves, wolverines, lynxes, and brown bears also may have posed a threat to the Neanderthals and their modern human cousins. It wasn't all megafauna and danger for the Neanderthals, though. As they crossed the steppe, they would have encountered vast herds of wild horses, reindeer, bison, saiga antelope, snow sheep, and muskox. Smaller mammals, such as squirrels, marmots, and pikas, would have formed colonies in the trees, on the rocks, and underground and a wide variety of bird species would have flown overhead. Vultures and eagles soared high above. Ravens and other passerines populated the trees, while bustards, ptarmigans, and waterfowl wandered the land. It was a diverse and expansive landscape, as full of wonder as it was danger for our ancestors and their Neanderthal cousins. The Neanderthal DNA may exist within us today, but ultimately the Neanderthal does not. Why? What could have caused such a theoretically well-adapted creature to disappear from the face of the earth forever? There are, in fact, numerous theories, each and any of which could be true, or perhaps a combination of several factors. As the Pleistocene progressed, the Neanderthal population sizes became more sparse, and overall number of Neanderthals started to decrease. Eventually, there were very few left, and before long, there were none at all. This could have been the result of interbreeding with human beings. One theory is that their population gradually assimilated itself into ours towards the end of the Pleistocene. The Homo sapiens in these men and women outlasted the Homo neanderthalensis due to the larger population size, and the Neanderthals eventually disappeared as a result, as the theory goes. Another possible cause is climate change. As the mammoth steppe began to recede, the climate began to warm up, and the megafauna began to disappear from the face of the earth. The Neanderthal's environment and food sources began to dwindle. In a world more suited to more advanced Homo sapiens, the Neanderthals may not have been able to compete and died out as a result. Finally, Disease is theorized to have been the answer. Maybe an epidemic swept its way through the Neanderthal population, a disease that Homo sapiens outlasted or was immune to. As the disease swept through the steppe, Neanderthals could have passed away in huge numbers, 
promptly putting an end to the species. Whatever the reason is, Neanderthals disappeared from the face of our world around 40,000 years ago, and Homo sapiens began to become the most prominent species in Eurasia, ultimately spreading out across the entire globe. While the Neanderthals may be long gone, we are only really at the beginning of our journey into our knowledge of them. We know relatively little about how they lived, how they communicated, what they may have thought, or how they could have interacted with other species or even each other. They remain one of the most fascinating species to ever grace the fossil record. Another species of human that our ancestors lived and interacted with, gone from the face of the earth for reasons that are still vague. While it may be a shame that we can never encounter a Neanderthal, it is pleasant to think about how our perception of this species has grown and evolved over the years. Many modern depictions of Neanderthals show the life and soul within the individuals painting them more as humans than brutish apes. Modern archaeological artists or paleoartists have done this better than anyone, and we would encourage you to look up modern depictions of Neanderthals for yourself to get a sense of what they really may have looked like. We hope you enjoyed this video. Perhaps it has brought you a little closer to our ancient cousins.